Dr. Joseph Paluski, who's been a CF and lung transplant physician for over 20 years. He's an associate professor of medicine, pediatrics, and clinical and translational science at the University of Pittsburgh and University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He's also associate chief for clinical affairs in the pulmonary, pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine Division at UPMC. As medical director of the lung transplant program, he has a long history of basic and clinical investigations related to CF and lung transplantation. As co-executive director of the CF Lung Transplant Initiative, he leads research efforts to improve the care of individuals with CF before and after lung transplantation. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Paluski, who will present expanding opportunities for lung transplant for individuals with cystic fibrosis. Welcome, Dr. Paluski. Thanks very much, Jim. It's really a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to provide some background education and hopefully answer some questions at the end. Um, I've titled this Expanding Opportunities for Lung Transplant for Individuals with Cystic Fibrosis. And what you'll see is that transplant is a work in progress. There's a fair amount of controversy. There are certainly areas where we strive to do better um, with the way things uh, move forward. So by way of outline, this is what I hope to accomplish in the next 40 or so minutes. We'll talk very briefly about the pathophysiology of CF and the impact of uh, modulator therapies. And the reason for that is just to understand where lung transplant fits into the scheme of treatment options. We'll talk about advanced lung disease, what that is, what it looks like, and then we'll spend the balance of our time talking about transplant as a treatment option. So I have no financial or other conflicts of interest. I will confess that I am a believer in the value of lung transplant as a treatment option for many, not all, individuals who have advanced uh, lung disease. And I have, as I said, no financial conflicts to consider. So I wanted to start with this, and I think all of you who are well versed in, in cystic fibrosis um, know where the last 30 years of research have led us. You know, back in 1989, the gene was isolated, uh, the mutation was isolated that causes CF. And we now know that that abnormal gene defect leads to an abnormal protein causes defects in ion transport, that is salt and water movement across the surfaces in the lung, the sinuses and the GI tract in particular. In the lung, you have a drying out or surface liquid depletion that causes problems with mucociliary clearance. And then we end up, unfortunately, in this vicious cycle at the bottom of the slide of mucus obstruction, infection, inflammation, uh, lung scarring, and then this vicious cycle is perpetuated over years to decades and leads to what we call end-stage lung disease that we'll define later. So we all know the major treatments for cystic fibrosis. We start with exercise and airway clearance to help fix mucus obstruction, antibiotics, both maintenance inhaled or judicious use orally and IV to treat infection, we have research um, on lung transplantation that we'll talk about as an option for end-stage lung disease. And then if we move up this list, hypertonic saline and mannitol for surface liquid depletion, uh, sodium channel or ENAC inhibitors for defective ion transport, these are in clinical trial again now. We have abnormalities in the CF protein and how it works. And we address these in patients who are eligible with CFTR modulators and then lastly, what's been the holy grail of CF research for the last 30 years is gene editing and gene replacement. And there's a tremendous effort currently to try and address and develop mechanisms by which one could fix the gene or replace the a normal copy of the gene into the cells that are necessary. So that's the pathophysiology and lung transplant sits down here at the bottom as one of our options for individuals who have and stage lung disease. So what do we know about the modulators? Um, well, we know they were really dramatically effective in patients who had a G551D mutation. Uh, this slide shows time on this bottom or so-called x-axis and change in lung function on the y-axis. The gray line is the group of patients who received placebo. 
the blue line, those that receive ibucaftor, and there was a 10% increase in lung function as measured by FEV1 over the course of this almost one year long study. So this was a transformative therapy for patients who had this particular G551D mutation, and now for about 15% of mutations uh, that cause CF disease. Uh, fast forward eight or 10 years, and now we have Trikafta or Alexacafta, Tezacafta, Ibacafta, which I'll refer to as ETI. Trikafta is the uh, brand name. ETI is the generic compound name. This is a three drug combination of two correctors and one potentiator that help correct the most common CF defect, the F508 DEL mutation. And I won't go through the details of this other than to, to show that in both this light blue and dark blue, the control groups are negative, negative, negative. These hash lines have no treatment. And as you go up to the three drug combination, you see significant improvements in chloride transport. So helping to restore fluid and, and uh, salt movement across the surface of the airways. When you look at lung function in these studies, there was again, very much like Ivacaftor, a 10% increase in lung function with different dosing regimens. And in the bottom panel, a significant reduction in the sweat chloride value almost to normal levels. Uh, so now this, uh, this drug is available for uh, patients who have one uh, F508 deletion mutation. And then in 2020, the label was extended for an additional 177 mutations. And we also have work going on trying to look at rare mutations by looking at the cells in the lab to understand whether this drug combination may work for other mutations since it's been found to be a, a safe and effective treatment. So this again shows uh, other important endpoints. This is lung function improvement over the six month time period. The blue line shows an increase of about 13% in FEV1. The gray line is the uh, tr untreated uh, control or placebo uh, population. If you look at the range of responses, I think this is important to note that the vast majority of individuals had greater than a five to 10% increase in FEV1 starting here in the middle, but it, it is also important to remember that there's a small percentage of patients within this cohort, maybe 10 or 15% that derive relatively little benefit. And so we were still trying to understand this. It's an important area in CF research to understand why you have patients who have these really dramatic increases in lung function, 25, 30 or more percent uh, FEV1 to those who had more minimal responses Importantly, there were decreases in numbers of chest infections or pulmonary exacerbations, uh, hospitalizations, and IV antibiotic treatments comparing the gray and the blue. So dramatic treatment effects with ETI for those who are eligible and respond. Um, I'm gonna skip this for the sake of time. So we'll come back to the issue of, of the modulators, particularly the ETI. But I wanna now turn and pivot and, and talk about advanced CF lung disease. So, so what is advanced CF lung disease? Well, we have a lot of different diseases that cause significant lung impairment and, and CF is one of them. In, in the case of CF, sort of like what we see with COPD or emphysema, there's advanced obstruction. Uh, that's the, in CF, the result of decades of infection, inflammation, and progressive bronchiectasis. It's a word for scarring dilatation of the airways. It's important, been important for us to try and identify this population because this is a population of individuals who historically, certainly those not on modulators, were at risk for having rapidly progressive disease and being at risk for dying. So research over the last decade or so has shown that these are markers of people who have advanced lung disease, FEV1 less than 40% predicted, a need for, for supplemental oxygen, a high carbon dioxide, that's what hypercapnia is, a PCO2 greater than 45. And then lastly, people who have so-called refractory pulmonary exacerbations. So these are individuals who have four or more episodes of, of acute chest infection in a year. We know that that's a marker for having severe disease. 
So if we use these as the markers, um, it allows us to really focus attention, making sure that we're exploring all of the treatment options that might be available. It's also useful to look at low lung, the population of patients with low lung function and, and their survival. In this nice registry study that was published by Kathy Ramos and her colleagues at the University of Washington, they used the powerful CF patient registry uh, to look at what happened to a group of patients who had FEV1 under 30, so even a worse lung function than FEV1 under 40, and looked at them over time, and this is in years, on the bottom, um, and the number of patients and the percentage of patients who either died or underwent lung transplantation. And several um, concerning things here. Um, the most, most important one is that if we look at the percentage who died over the first couple of years, it's about 10% per year, which is a really significant number. And while there are some individuals with FEV1s of Ten, uh, of, of less than 30 that live 10 years, it's a pretty small number compared to the big population that we, she started with. If you look at the number of people who were transplanted, it's lower than the number of patients who are died, who died. And these data suggest to us that we are missing out on the opportunity potentially by not getting patients access to transplant quickly enough uh, before they die from their disease. Many of these patients had not been referred or evaluated for transplant and never had the opportunity to uh, explore that treatment option. So before I, I turn to talk about transplant in particular, I wanted to just highlight some of the complications that we see in, in advanced CF lung disease. So if we look at the broad umbrella of advanced lung disease, not all patients have the same set of problems. Uh, commonly, we see what's called deconditioning, that is loss of muscle tone and muscle function. And we see with decreased activity, we see redu reductions in mucus clearance. Well, there's a relatively simple way to address that, and it's, it's called exercise. So pulmonary rehabilitation uh, is a formal exercise program that we recommend for patients, particularly with advanced lung disease. Uh, to try and minimize or prevent deconditioning, make sure their lung and heart function are as good as they can be so that patients can derive the most function despite having low lung function. Frequent exacerbations I mentioned, um, antibiotics are oftentimes very helpful and we sometimes use uh, corticosteroids like prednisone to help get patients through an exacerbation. Hypoxemia is with low oxygen concentration in the blood. And it's something that we, we've learned over the years uh, requires regular assessment of oxygen saturation. So typically patients will have their oxygen saturation checked in the clinic while they're sitting at rest and they may be, they may be fine. But in patients with advanced disease, a fair number of those individuals have a drop in their oxygen saturation when they're walking uh, or exercising more vigorously or when they're sleeping. So it's now a standard to really look carefully and, and try and find low oxygen saturation early because one can provide supplemental oxygen through a nasal cannula that will help minimize the bad effects of low oxygen on the heart and increase functional capacity. Pulmonary hypertension is a form of hypertension that doesn't involve the major arteries that you measure in somebody's arm, but involves the blood vessels in the, in the lung. Uh, so the pulmonary hypertension develops in some patients with uh, advanced CF lung disease. And we treat that, we need to identify that early because the major cause of that is low oxygen saturation. Uh, secondly, there are some drugs called vasodilators that are sometimes helpful to reduce the pressures in the lung and prevent, their, prevent the further development of heart complications. A hypercapnia is high carbon dioxide in the blood. Again, this is something we recommend uh, screening periodically in patients with advanced lung disease. And then when it's detected, we can sometimes use what's called non-invasive or BiPAP ventilation, which involves a mask over the face connected to a machine that provides pressures that make it more effective and easier to move air in and out of the lung. And then lastly, 
we, we try very hard to prevent this, but uh, patients with advanced lung disease are at risk of developing respiratory failure, which is a failure of the lungs where without further support like a mechanical ventilator or, or lungs, lung transplant, patients are going to die from their disease. Uh, so these are some of the issues that we face in patients with advanced lung disease. And we wanna be aggressive about screening for them, things like oxygen saturation, carbon dioxide, and we do echocardiograms, ultrasound of the heart, uh, for an easy way to assess for pulmonary hypertension. So let's pivot now to lung transplant. Um, it's important to remember that lung transplant is in its relative infancy, um, meaning uh, lung transplants started a little bit later than, than kidney and other transplants. And, and in the early years, from the 60s to 1981, uh, there were about 40 lung transplants performed and the survival was terrible. The longest survival was six to eight months. Uh, there were lots of surgical pump problems and lung failure after transplant with rejection of the new organ. And surgeons like Joel Cooper, multiple pictures of him uh, shown here, uh, really were determined uh, to make this work the way it had for kidneys and, and hearts and livers and other organs. Uh, so a number of programs, the one at St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Toronto, uh, a couple in Europe, uh, really, really were committed to this and spent uh, lots of time and energy trying to identify uh, who, who was an appropriate transplant candidate and how they could improve outcomes. The whole field was transformed by the development of new anti-rejection medication, cyclosporin. So prior to that, the outcomes were really honestly dismal. After the advent of cyclosporin, things really started to look up and, and the surgeons learned what the complications were and were able to begin to address them. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, issues around survival and what that data looks like in the current era. But I wanted to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes of talking about what we've come to call the transplant journey. Uh, in order to get to the end, end goal of receiving a lung transplant, if individuals are interested, uh, there has to be an initial referral. Uh, that referral will oftentimes lead to an evaluation by a transplant program uh, that will lead to, uh, if everything goes well, to listing on a lung transplant list and then to transplant itself. Uh, so multiple steps in this process, and it's really important to remember that this is not something that happens in the span of a few days to a week. It almost invariably takes longer than a week and, and if done right, really takes months because we don't, want, we don't want patients to come to transplant in a very rushed way. So what are the goals of transplant? Why, why do we do this? I've mentioned that it's imperfect, but we need something for patients with advanced lung disease and respiratory failure, approaching respiratory failure with the goal of trying to prolong survival in this group of patients after we've failed all other treatment options. So I like to think about treatments for CF and other diseases as plan A's and plan B. Uh, there are lots of plan A's in CF now, thanks to all the progress over the last 20 years. And what we need now is a better plan B. Right now, transplant is our main plan B. It's an opportunity when all other treatment failures uh, where all their treatments fail uh, to pursue lung transplant and um, prolong survival. The goals are pretty straightforward. We want to improve symptoms. So we want to give people a better quality of life by uh, taking away uh, cough and shortness of breath and oxygen burden and all the treatment burdens. And we want to improve physiology so that other organ failure doesn't occur. I, I mentioned survival, and I think it's important to put this in a broader context. This is the most some of the most recent data we have on outcomes for lung transplant in a variety of lung diseases. Uh, the, this y-axis shows survival and the x-axis, uh, the, the horizontal line shows number of years. Uh, the, these outcomes are still disappointing, but if your alternative is, is dying from lung disease, um, they, they, they do have some attraction. Uh, importantly, the long-term survival for individuals with CF shown in purple is better than it is for other lung diseases uh, where, in which transplant is really relevant. So the median survival right now for individuals with CF is about 10 years. So median means 
half of the individuals who are transplanted are alive at 10 years and half have died from complications of transplant. That gets at the point that I wanna make that survival is highly variable. If things go very poorly with complications, survival may be in the, in the measurement of days and the time of days. And then I have a patients that we see, I have one gentleman that I saw, I saw last week who was transplanted in 1989. So in the infancy of lung transplant, he's now over 30 years after transplant. The greatest risk for complications is in the first few years. And so as I like to tell patients, the first few years are where their greatest landmines are. And we'll talk about those landmines, but infection and rejection are, are, are clearly the, the, the most important and, and significant ones. So let's take each bucket of this transplant journey and break it down to individual components. So if we start with referral, in order for that to happen, there really needs to be a discussion of advanced lung disease so that patients and families understand where patients are in their disease trajectory. Secondly, we need a decision about whether the patient family, once they receive education, either from outside sources or ideally from their CF center, whether they wish to pursue transplant. If the answer is yes, then patients are referred to a transplant center. And there are, I think, 76 or 77 active lung transplant centers in the United States right now. And so that referral typically occurs to the geographically most accessible or convenient transplant center. So that's the referral piece of this and early education and early decision-making as we'll see in a minute is really important. Our goal here is to get um, patients to uh, transplant uh, before they're too ill to undergo a transplant with few complications without many complications, excuse me. So the short-term survival for individuals with severe lung disease is very unpredictable. So this is a registry data from Kathy Ramos that looked at the median survival at FEV1 under 30%. And it was six and a half years, much better than it was back when this was last examined in the 1990s when median survival at this level of lung function was only about two years. So it's highly variable, but unfortunately, we don't have great predictors of, of who's going to die soon with this kind of lung function and who's going to survive a long time. So defining that optimal window, if we're honest about it, is very difficult. We make assessments, we make our best educated guesses, but we don't have formulas that say, this is precisely your one year survival with these clinical features that you have at that time in your disease. So we've learned over the years that it's much better to refer patients early than late. There's a, a significant educational process that goes on. And if patients are referred early and get feedback from the transplant center, there's an opportunity to modify risks or problems that may impact transplant outcome. A second point that I wanna make is that referral for transplantation doesn't mean that a patient's gonna to go to transplant prematurely. There was some concern that patients would be referred early and then they'd get a transplant at a time when they could have lived a long time without a transplant. Our goal here is to find the sweet spot, but when you don't know exactly what the sweet spot is, having the knowledge and information up front to have that plan B in place is really important. Uh, last general point is that wait times after people are on the list vary based on how sick people are. So there's an allocation scheme that prioritizes patients who have more advanced disease over those that have less severe disease. And those wait times in most programs now vary from days to people who are critically ill uh, to a few months. Occasionally patients will have circumstances where the waiting time is even longer, six months to a year or, or even two to three years. So again, having an assessment by the transplant center is really important. We convened with the CF Foundation sponsored and convened a, a consensus group of transplant and CF physicians a few years ago and published this lung transplant referral guideline uh, back in was it 2019. 
and, and essentially what we what we thought about and proposed to CF clinicians and, and patients and families was that transplant would be introduced on the left side of the screen fairly early in the in the in the trajectory of lung function. So historically, the lung function curve might look like this. This is pre-modulator, and this would evolve over several decades. But we didn't want transplant to be considered something that's that's so outside the box that, box that you don't even learn about it. By starting at an FEV1 of 15% predict, 50% predicted, we recommended annual discussion of lung transplant with a focus on potential barriers. At 40%, and lower, we recommended screening for markers of disease severity. And patients who had this level of lung function and also had country and had problems like pulmonary hypertension or needed oxygen or had frequent chest infections, that they actually be referred here rather than waiting till this under 30%, which was the referral recommendation cutoff for all patients. Uh, this allows sufficient time for the evaluation process to, to be completed. And it also allows the opportunity to pursue a different transplant center that transplant's not feasible. So early introduction of lung transplant as a potential therapeutic option, early referral to allow addressing modifiable barriers. And then as I mentioned, there's multiple steps in this process and one doesn't automatically lead to the next to the next. And then the last point I, I, I will make, and I think this is really important, is that we, we want CF providers to give patients the benefit of the doubt. CF physicians may have, or other providers may have concerns that somebody's not a transplant candidate and be reluctant to refer them. We want the CF centers to educate patients, but we'd like the transplant programs to be the ones that help, to help make that decision on candidacy. Because we have a circumstance where patients are declined or not even referred for transplant from their CF center, and they independently come to a transplant center and manage to get successfully transplanted. There are great resources on the CF Foundation website. Um, this is uh, one a screenshot of the uh, pages on cff.org. Aaron Tellerico and a number of other individuals help work on this um, inf uh, educational information, and it really is comprehensive and provides just outstanding information, uh, in my opinion. So I think I've highlighted uh, a lot of these things. Uh, so I'll run through this really quickly. Um, we want patients and families to know about transplant. We want to identify barriers to transplant so that we can address them. Uh, psychosocial and financial or insurance complications are uh, a significant issue for many. And then there's these controversial comorbidities that I'll talk about in just a minute, and then the potential need for second opinion and referral. So very briefly, what does the evaluation look like? Uh, evaluation requires insurance clearance and medical record review by the transplant program. There's a scheduling piece that takes some time. Uh, once patients are scheduled and evaluated, they meet with a whole team of people, a surgeon, a pulmonary transplant specialist, a social worker, a dietitian, a financial uh, credit analyst, oftentimes a mental health provider. Those folks all weigh in and the selection committee um, has occurs sometime usually a week or so after the patient visit and the selection committee makes a recommendation for what the next phase should be for transplant. If we do our job right, the majority of patients should be deferred for transplant, meaning uh, educated, identify barriers and be put on hold with the plan that when they really need a transplant, you can almost flip a switch and get them listed for transplant. So that's the evaluation process and it's a, it's a big time and energy commitment, but it's really important and incredibly educational for uh, patients and families. Uh, what does the ideal transplant candidate look like? Well, it's a single organ disease, a good insight, impeccable compliance, uh, very few in this world have meet, meet those criteria. Uh, so we think about the major barriers and I've listed a lot of those and won't go into them in, in, gory, in gory detail. Uh, but suffice to say that psychiatric illness and lack of psychosocial support, other um, unusual infections at some programs are uh, barriers to transplant, particularly active HIV and hepatitis 
Mycobacterial infections are controversial. And then other organ problems, kidneys, liver, heart, and um, endocrine problems like osteoporosis. And then lastly, we face a big problem with narcotic addiction. And there's controversies or differences among programs in the requirement for patients who are on long-term narcotics or how they're managed prior to transplant. This is one example of somebody who was a very complicated uh, transplant patient who had a uh, burkholderia infection and destruction of this right lung. Uh, he underwent a transplant, and this is what his x-ray looks like after transplant. You see a nice, well-expanded, normal-looking right lung compared to what he had before, and a really healthy-looking left lung as well. So this is what we do with transplant, we hope, is take patients who have a really severe lung scarring and destruction and give them a new set of lungs so they have a second opportunity at a better quality of life. I'm not going to go into great detail about the controversies, but... Uh, suffice to say that there are differences among different uh, transplant programs for their criteria. And those revolve around things like liver disease, what happens when patients are on a ventilator, uh, fungus infections, atypical mycobacterial infections, uh, pseudomonas and other gram-negative pan-resistant infections, and then Burkholderia patia. I know that this conference included some nice presentations on uh, the phage technology, and I want to commend and recommend uh, the, the two wonderful books uh, written about uh, courageous young women who had CF and Burkholderia infections, uh, Salt in My Soul and Unfinished Matches, uh, the heart-wrenching stories about uh, attempts of these patients and families to obtain a successful transplant and how they dealt with the complications. Uh, the families, the mothers of these two patients, have, have done a tremendous job with education uh, and providing uh, advocacy uh, so that we don't forget about this population of patients with unusual infections and we try and improve their opportunities for transplant and a good outcome. Um, listing for transplant is a mutual decision um, based on discussion uh, with the patient and the transplant and the CF center. It's really a three-legged decision-making process when it's done right. Uh, one of the challenges once people go on the list is all the uncertainty about when transplant's going to happen. And we, it's something we just have to support people and, and provide reassurance where we can and make sure that they're getting a good, good support from their local CF teams and mental health providers. Um, this is an example of the listing challenges we face now. So this is an individual we saw for transplant before he went on Trikafta. These white circles are areas where the lung is plugged and the airways are plugged and the lung disease was quite severe. This is this same individual um, six or so months after going on uh, ETI or Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ibacaptor, and you see all these white blocked airways are now open. They now have black air in them and the other areas of scarring. These walls are really thick on some of these airways. They look so much better. And this was one of the individuals who had a tremendous response to ETI with a marked improvement in lung function such that he's no longer really needs a lung transplant. Um, the impact of uh, ETI on advanced CF lung disease was demonstrated in a registry study that was done in France and published last year. Uh, what they showed was that at the time, they, uh, right before they used ETI therapy uh, of patients who had advanced lung disease, there were 15% in the dark blue who were referred for transplant and 6% who were on the transplant list. So they added these two together and said about a quarter of the patients were in the transplant pathway. After uh, six months or so of Trikafta or ETI, 97% uh, were not considered for transplant. Um, there, was only, there were only four on the transplant list. Uh, two had been transplanted and of that population, one deceased without a transplant. So the number of patients who were in the transplant path on the right uh, decreased dramatically as patients had improvements in lung function. Uh, they uh, had improvements in oxygen need and other uh, di severe disease indicators and were able to defer transplant. So I mentioned the listing decisions and I think we really uh, unfortunately have two populations uh, now in, in, in adults with CF, with advanced CF lung disease. We have those that are, that are on highly effective modulator and those who aren't eligible 
or don't respond or are intolerant for side effects. So in the population of patients who are not on infective modulator, there's a significant risk of acute decline uh, to respiratory failure, and there's clearly a survival advantage associated with getting a transplant. We've learned, we're learning as time goes on that patients with CF1 highly effective modulator are likely to have much slower progression of their lung disease. They can live a lot longer on oxygen. They have a low risk of a lower risk of acute progression to respiratory failure. And so transplant in many of those patients at this point might be an issue of quality of life rather than clear cut survival. So these decisions aren't getting any easier. It's a, it's a great challenge to face, but we have to have really frank conversations with patients and families and discussion between the CF and transplant center about when the right time is to go to transplant based on variability, such as whether their patients are on modulator and how they're doing over time. Um, there are some challenges with allocation. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail about that today. That'll be a, a whole separate topic. Um, so I'm gonna just mention briefly that um, the, the last thing uh, is that there's significant differences in, in, in the ability of transplant programs to uh, proceed with transplant after people develop respiratory failure. And one of the advances that's helped us over the last a decade or so has been improved outcomes for patients who are on a technology called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO. Uh, this is a, a device that's inserted in a vein that's shown on the right side of the graphic. Uh, there's a catheter that's placed in the vein and the catheter ends in the heart and has two channels such that blood is pulled out through one channel and put back in the other. Blood removed, run through an oxygenator carbon dioxide is removed, so it's sort of acting like a, a lung assist device, and then a blood with good oxygen and carbon dioxide is returned to the heart. And this has been very helpful in patients who progress to uh, respiratory failure uh, quickly and haven't had a chance to get a transplant. Uh, so lastly, the transplant process involves uh, surgery and recovery that usually evolves over um, Ideally, two weeks to three weeks. Unfortunately, it can take longer if there are complications and can be shorter. So I've seen patients discharge nine days after lung transplant, and I've seen patients discharge two to three months after lung transplant. So it's highly variable, uh, and we just have to address the, the challenges early after transplant and give time for healing to occur. The aftercare of transplant is really important, as we, and we're giving more and more attention to this through our CF Lung Transplant Consortium. Uh, we have to find ways to help patients manage new medications. And our real goal after transplant through routine care is to prevent complications. We wanna address the things that are potentially going to happen so that we can minimize, uh, the, 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 minimize those complications and improve survival. Uh, this is the transplant surgery. It's actually fairly uh, straightforward in terms of the connections between the old and new lungs. It happens in the pulmonary artery the airway and a pulmonary vein. So it's three connections on each side of the chest. And the biggest challenge with these operations, my surgical colleagues tell me, is oftentimes getting the old lung out. So the old lung gets stuck in the chest, if you will. And so getting that lung out is sometimes what causes significant bleeding and challenges in the operating room. So there are a number of um, phases after transplant. There's a post-op recovery, which is usually days to weeks. There's the early post-transplant adjustment period where lung function is typically increasing and people are getting their medical regimen tweaked. That's the early post-transplant era. Then there's a more intermediate period of one to five years and then long-term uh, patients who are alive and doing well more than five years after transplant. And what we're trying to do is prevent or address um, some of the more frequent complications as they come. So graft failure is a very early and thankfully rare complication Infection risk is highest earliest, early after transplant, and decreases somewhat over time. We try and prevent and treat when it's detected, acute cellular rejection. Again, that occurs most commonly in the first couple of years after transplant. Uh, there's a form of antibody-mediated rejection. Uh, kidney failure can occur. Uh, cancer can occur, usually in later long-term survivors. And then chronic rejection. So chronic rejection is really the 
It, it's the bugaboo of transplant outcomes. And the CF Foundation has wisely invested uh, millions of dollars into an initiative to try and better understand chronic rejection and get it uh, prevented and treated uh, so that we can improve long-term survival after transplant. So our vision for the future of transplant is, is fairly straightforward. We wanna increase organ availability and allocation. So we don't want patients dying on a waiting list. Uh, the most recent data suggests that about 10% of patients will die while waiting for transplant. That's not really acceptable. And we wanna try and do some things to make that better by improving the allocation schema. We wanna understand the mechanisms of rejection and identify tests to detect rejection and infection early. Um, and then we want to allow, as a result of that, if we prevent rejection, we can allow all transplant recipients to enjoy a normal lifespan, live 20, 30 years after transplant. Um, this is a data slide. I think it's important to note. It again gets at the impact of uh, ETI or Trikafta. This is national data. So looking at transplants across the country, number on the y-axis, that's the vertical axis, and year on the horizontal axis. axis. And what you see is that lung transplant volume went up during the decade of the 2010s, uh, peaked prior to the pandemic, about 2,700 transplants a year in the US. And, and of those, about 260 were done for CF, so 9%. And historically, you see between nine and 12% of uh, transplants were done uh, for patients with CF. Along comes um, Alexa Capter, Teza Capter, Iva Capter. In 2020, that percentage drops to 3%. Uh, in 2021, to 2%. And it looks like this year, there's a good chance there's going to be less than 50 lung transplants for CF across the country this year. So thankfully, uh, lesser need, but it's important. It gives us an opportunity. Uh, to spend our time learning how to do things better for transplants so that if and when this population of patients with advanced lung disease needs a transplant, they'll have better outcomes. I want to just mention a few other things that I think are really important for thinking about advanced lung disease and transplant. Uh, one is palliative care. Uh, so there's been a, a nice initiative by the CF Foundation uh, that is addressing the palliative care needs. We know on the left-hand side of this slide, we know that patients have physical, emotional, social, and practical, spiritual, and existential issues that make life really difficult when you have severe lung disease. As a result of that, we think palliative care will be very helpful and its intensity may vary over time. Uh, this CF Foundation group is really trying to identify what the best mechanism is uh, to uh, utilize palliative care, should it be a referral to a palliative care specialist, or should it be done by education of CF clinic providers where they can do the primary care and address the needs of those with advanced lung disease. There are some screening techniques, uh, screening tools, the IPOS and BASC that are helpful to identify patients who have palliative care needs and try and get them the support that they need so they can maximize their quality of life while they have advanced lung disease. Uh, the other uh, article for those of you who may have had a transplant, uh, we have consensus statements on the care of lung transplant patients with CF. So this is aftercare. We learned as part of this consensus work, uh, this workshop uh, found, we found that there were variabilities among centers. We tried to come to some consensus about what care should look like after transplant from CF follow-up care and communication and infection control, uh, how we address infections and sinus disease, uh, how do we face the nutrition and, and GI problems that patients continue to have after transplant because we're replacing their lungs, but we're not replacing uh, their, their intestine, they're not improving nutrition. Diabetes is really common after transplant if it's not present before. So how do we best treat diabetes? How do we take care of bone health so patients aren't getting fractures as they live longer. Mental health and family planning become really important after transplant. It's a big adjustment to go from being sick every day to being well. And while one would think that that's easy, it, it, in my experience, is oftentimes not. And then lastly, we addressed issues about pharmacology. So what drugs should we be using? Who should be prescribing them? 
uh, those sorts of issues. So we want to come up with some consensus guidelines and help make sure that CF and transplant centers are doing the best they can. We think that shared care is really the way to go, that shared care after transplant with a multidisciplinary approach where the dietitian and the social worker and the other team members on the CF side aren't lost and patient can continue to get input from a CF specialist and a lung transplant specialist. Uh, a number of factors go into what the best model is or best approaches for an individual patient, things like geography, financial resources, insurance coverage. We have some transplant providers who have a lot of experience in CF and work very actively in both domains. Uh, I'm one of those, that I have, there's at least a half a dozen of us around the country. We generally can manage both CF and transplant issues. Many CF providers don't have expertise in transplant and need to allow the transplant team to take care of the lung and the transplant complications and the transplant medications. Um, and then the other variable is how much, how much experience the CF care team has with transplants. Some CF care teams have a lot of accumulated experience and knowledge over the years and some have very little. So it's critical to define roles. Uh, we have some agreement that the transplant team should own the lungs and should manage immunosuppression. And the CF team can help manage nutrition, bone health, mental health. Uh, we have a white paper that is in revision um, after public comment and hopefully will be published later this year to provide um, more granular guidance to um, CF uh, and transplant uh, care centers. We think a shared care model between teams and separate institutions will be the most common situation. And then there'll be a few programs where the transplant team has CF expertise and can provide all care. But again, that's going to be a limited number. Communication and crisis planning are, are really, really, really important. So transplant's a complicated uh, process. It's a complicated procedure. There are multiple team members. Uh, it's, it's a complex uh, dynamic. And I think that one message I want to leave for you, both whether you're uh, very early with transplant as being something that's years to decades potentially in your future uh, or something more imminent, or if you've had a transplant, is it's important to seek help. Make sure you communicate, advocate for yourself. I live in Pittsburgh, and this is a statue of our beloved Fred Rogers. Uh, during the pandemic and during difficult times, uh, particularly the patients with or individuals with healthcare issues, I think it's important that we always look for helpers. You know, that we live in a society where there's lots of people who want to help. We just need to ask. We need to advocate for ourselves and communicate with one another. Uh, so here's Mr. Rogers overlooking uh, the city of Pittsburgh. And we'd like to think that the example that he sets and the teachings that he's had uh, are beneficial not only to children, but also to adults as they navigate a complex world. Uh, so in summary, advanced CF is a multi-organ problem with a variable time course and that we have a difficult time predicting survival. Highly effective modulators slow progression of CF lung disease and may allow for transplant listing to be deferred. At this point, we continue to recommend early referral because we want to be able to educate and optimize the opportunity and give patients the best chance at a good outcome. I didn't show the data over time, but lung transfer survival is improving. We're getting uh, smarter all the time on how to manage the complications and how we deal with the immune system. Uh, so I am uh, very hopeful that the future is bright uh, for transplant for CF, particularly with a support of the CF Foundation and partnerships with uh, pharmaceutical industries uh, to help develop uh, new, new therapies to prevent complications. So I'm gonna close there um, and I'll be happy to take any uh, questions um, if that works. Dr. Poluski, thank you so very much for that incredible presentation. And um, for those I'm sure most people that are here know that uh, Dr. Poluski was Mallory Smith's uh, doctor. And if you watch the documentary, you'll see him. We are very sadly right one minute past our entire time. And I also wanna say there's probably 25 questions for you, Dr. Poluski. So if I could ask maybe one or two, and then I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if maybe sure. we could record a little Q&A post-conference sure. podcast, you know, in a week or so, 
two weeks when you have time to, and then we can post that. So everybody will save these questions. I don't know if that works for you. You can pause sure. put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so for people who uh, have had transplants already, a key question for many was how do you, are there better strategies for predicting um, infection of the lungs from the sinuses? Uh, I don't think we have a way to predict it. I do think we have the opportunity to reduce the risk um, so I, I think that doing surveillance cultures of the sinuses and also we do in our program and most programs uh, surveillance bronchoscopy to try and detect bacteria in the lower airways and, and if patients are found to be colonized, if you will, with the same sort of pseudomonas or other bacteria that are in the sinuses, I think there probably is a role for inhaled antibiotics as a way to reduce the burden of those bacteria and help prevent any contribution that I might have uh, to a poor transplant outcome. And are there any drugs in the pipeline that are better immunosuppressants? I know you said they're researching this, but are there things in the pipeline? Yeah, there, are, there are a number of, of potent immunosuppressive medications. Uh, there's a class of drugs called uh, JAK inhibitors so these inhibit a specific part of the inflammatory pathway. Those have been studied to um, some degree. There's a, a form of inhaled immunosuppression therapy called cyclosporin that's in a phase three trial right now, has a lot of promise. Uh, and then there are other novel immunosuppressive agents. Um, the specific names don't matter, but they, they basically target pathways in the inflammatory system, in the, in the immune system. And there are companies and investigators working on ways to demonstrate or study them in, in patients with CF and, and other transplant recipients. And lastly, just to give kudos to our CF community, I know you showed the statistics about how outcomes are better for people with CF than other transplant recipients. And is it because of our community's knowledge of self-care and medical regimens for their whole lifetimes? I think that the compliance with care is certainly part of it. I think patients with CF are, are used to uh, having very burdensome care before transplant with hours of aerosol treatments a day. And then along comes transplant and you basically switch from a heavy aerosol regimen to a heavy pill regimen. Um, I, that oftentimes is a very easy adjustment and patients do it you know, very well. Uh, I think the other thing is that you, you can't beat youth so in general, the patients, of pop, the patients who are transplanted for CF are younger than patients who are transplanted for other diseases. Uh, so they have the advantage of youth and healthier hearts and healthier kids and greater will, frankly. They're just, they're determined. Uh, I think a 65-year-old runs into complications is different from a 35-year-old. I think those are some of the variables that go into that. Well, I look forward to continuing the conversation with you and I express my gratitude to you for sharing your time, especially this momentous weekend for you um, and your, ex, your incredible expertise. And I do look forward to having the other um, questions, a little session with you for Q&A. And you should know the chat box is just blown up with everybody thanking you for your incredible presentation and all you do for the CF community. So thank you so much, Dr. Walewski. Thanks for the opportunity, Siri. We're, we're going to keep working at this and do better over time. Thank you. And Thank for you. everybody, we ran right on up, but in uh, five minutes, we will have the final session of the conference with the fabulous Emily Kramer Golenkoff. So I hope you all will see me in the next session. I can't believe we're getting to the end of this conference. So again, Dr. Poluski, much gratitude to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you and take care now. Thank you, you too.